the retropharyngeal space. This is the area between the buccopharyngeal fascia of the middle layer of the deep cervical fascia and the alar layer of the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia. This is termed as the retropharyngeal space. So if you see in the picture over here, retropharyngeal space, uh, the alar fascia, this is the alar fascia over here and this is the buccopharyngeal fascia over here. So the space in between these two layers is what is known as the retropharyngeal space. This space is also known as the posterior visceral space because it lies posterior to the pharynx and the cervical esophagus. This space acts as a bursa to allow the expansion of pharynx through during deglutition. So you see uh, this space is a potential space which lies behind the pharynx. Now coming to boundaries of the retropharyngeal space, superiorly lies the base of the skull. You can see over here, superiorly is the base of the skull, inferiorly is the bifurcation of trachea. So the alar fascia fuses with the buccopharyngeal fascia at the level of T4 and the carina. So this is the level of the T4 and the carina and this is where is the lower limit of the retropharyngeal space. Laterally lies the carotid sheath and its contents. Anteriorly lies the buccopharyngeal fascia covering the constrictors of the pharynx. Posteriorly lies the alar fascia. You see this is the alar fascia and this is the buccopharyngeal fascia. And the space, this space it is divided into two lateral compartments known as the spaces of the gillette by a fibrous raphe. The content of the space are the lymph node of the ruvier, also known as a retropharyngeal lymph node, the fat, loose areolar tissue, pharyngeal plexus of vas vessels and nerves, and it communicates with the parapharyngeal spaces anterolaterally on both the sides. Retropharyngeal abscess. So the source of infection in case of retropharyngeal abscess would be the suppuration of retropharyngeal lymph nodes secondary to infection in the adenoids, the nasopharynx, posterior nasal sinuses or the nasal cavity. So the retropharyngeal abscess is commonly seen in children below the age of 3 years. It can also be seen in adults obviously and in adults it will usually result from penetrating injury of the posterior pharyngeal wall or the cervical esophagus and rarely Pus from acute mastoiditis will track along the undersurface of the petrous bone to present as a retropharyngeal abscess. You see in the picture over here, this here is the retropharyngeal abscess. You can see how it is producing a unilateral swelling on the posterior pharyngeal wall. Now coming to clinical features of the retropharyngeal abscess. Dysphagia and difficulty in breathing will be the prominent symptoms because the abscess ends up obstructing the air and the food passages. Also there might be strider and a croupy cuff. Torticollis might be there where the neck becomes stiff and the head is kept extended. And there will be a bulge in the posterior pharyngeal wall usually seen on one side of the midline. In, ter in terms of imaging, we will do a radiograph of the soft tissue lateral view of the neck which will show a widening of the prevertebral shadow and possibly even the presence of gas. You can see over here, this is uh, over here that you can see how there is widening of the prevertebral shadow. A contrast enhanced CT scan will also show the extent of the abscess and also tell us whether the abscess extends below the level of the hyoid bone and any other associated abscess, most commonly the parapharyngeal abscess will also be seen. So the normal width, uh, if, one, one, if we have to read an x-ray in this case, we first have to know what is the normal width of a prevertebral soft tissue shadow. So the normal width at the level of C2 is 3.5 millimeter, with greater than 7 millimeter being abnormal in both adults and children. Or the prevertebral soft tissue at this level should exceed the width of the body of the C2 vertebra. So this is at the level of C2. Another measurement can be done at the level of C6 where a measurement exceeding 14 mm is abnormal in children and that exceeding 22 mm will be abnormal in adults. So this is how we read the x-ray prevertebral soft tissue shadow. 
Other findings which will be suggestive of abscess are prevertebral soft tissue shadow is more than 50% of the width of the vertebral body. There will be a straightening of the cervical spine. This will happen because of the spasm of the prevertebral muscles and there will be a presence of air shadow with or without fluid level. So in a retropharyngeal abscess case, how are we going to treat it? So treatment will first involve incision and drainage. Incision and drainage can be done without anesthesia as there is a risk of rupture of the abscess during intubation. The child is kept supine with head low, mouth is opened with a gag, a vertical incision will be given in the most fluctuant area of the abscess. The vertical incision is what you need to remember. And suction should always be present to prevent aspiration of the pus. If the case is being done under general anesthesia, care should be taken that abscess does not rupture during intubation with aspiration of the pus. And the pharynx should always be packed. So aspiration for an abscess can be done before incision to break the pressure in the abscess and gush of the pus. So other than incision and drainage, we have to give systemic antibiotics. And in some cases, a large abscess can lead to mechanical obstruction to the airway or laryngeal edema may develop. In these cases, because of respiratory difficulty, we have to do a tracheostomy. And if not treated adequately or uh, fast enough, it can lead to a lot of complications like hemorrhage, laryngeal spasm, bronchitis, septicemia, metastatic abscess, internal jugular vein thrombosis, carotid artery erosion, spontaneous rupture with uh, aspiration pneumonia due to the pus getting into the respiratory tract and spread to the other neck spaces and mediastinitis.